Okay, Ivan, let's uh, let's start this off with you telling us a little bit about your story, your journey, um, everything that led you to what you're doing now and what you're doing now. Yeah, with pleasure, Michael. Um, there are all kinds of places where I could start my story, but I'd like to start it at the start of my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a male lineage that had repressed sexuality and power quite strongly. Mm -hmm. I only realized that after many years of soul searching. But it was the beginning uh, of a really agonizing journey of falling apart for me at the start of my 20s. Yeah. Um, I think that particular t uh, age is is crucial in the, in the lives of most men and it's like we become more vulnerable mm -hmm. to to um, uh, maybe our soul you know there's there's a way our soul starts communicating to us and the way that it communicated to me in this in this part of my life was violent as fuck and I I was really afraid Michael Mm -hmm. Because what was starting to happen was that I saw myself killing people, I saw myself raping people, and uh, I was terrified of of being me basically at that uh, point in in my life, and and not knowing any uh, anything about what was going on for me, um, I I was desperate to find a way to deal with the terror of of this this tsunami of uh, terrifying imagery that was co hammering me constantly. Mm -hmm. And I discovered meditation. And uh, I meditated like a motherfucker for many years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Essentially, because I was afraid of myself. You know, what might happen if I lost control of my thoughts was that these these thoughts that had started at the start of my 20s, they, they, they came back. Mm -hmm. And um, it was only, uh, I think, when I was about 28 years old when I realized that I was running away from life with my meditation practice. Yeah. Um, I was in India uh, at that point. Uh, I was in Bodh Gaya. And I remember it distinctly to this day. You know, it's going to be one of those defining stories of my life. There was this uh, Swedish woman that I really liked there, um, mm -hmm. and we had a connection. We we kept meeting at this restaurant at the outskirts of Bodh Gaya. It was this dusty road with rickshaws and everything, and uh, and I liked her, man. I really did. Yeah. But my expertise was in meditation and not in talking to women. Yeah. So I had no idea what to do with this woman. And that story sort of ended uh, when my travel party, our group, we were about to leave Bodh Gaya and I was like running around the town trying to find her because I really wanted to see her again. And then I did find her, but I could see her back only and she was walking next to a man and she was sort of walking into the night and out of my life and I didn't find it in me to shout her name or to run after her because it looked like she was taken you yeah. know, by this other man. Mm -hmm. And my life completely changed at that point. I realized that my seven or eight years of intense meditation practice had been running away from basically uh, suppressing my desire and my, uh, my, my desire to be with women and to be more fully in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when... I discovered men's work and started opening up to the more primal parts of my psyche. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you come across archetypes in, in the way that you know them now? I think that must be uh, six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a podcast, uh, or actually I think it was a, a series of CDs I believe it was Adam Gillard. I think I don't remember exactly, but I think he interviewed someone who spoke about the archetypes, and I listened to that interview. Mm -hmm. So that must be six or seven years ago, and immediately I 
felt like felt at home. Yeah. Yeah. What what was it about it that uh connected with you? You know, I think that it was sort of an experience of coming full circle because when I was a little boy, like six or seven years old, I I was incredibly into fairy tales and mythology. Mm -hmm. And um, in those early years, you know, I would consume Greek mythology and Norwegian fairy tales and the Brothers Grimm and everything. And there was something about the way the archetypes spoke to me that had me reconnect with that part of me, that mythological, um, sort of a deeper, more earthy uh, quality of my psyche. Mm -hmm. I think that's what was going on there. Yeah, I can relate to that. When I when I first read uh, King Warrior, Magician, Lover, it was a similar, um, you know, resonance. It just it sort of made sense to me on a level beyond you know everyday. Um, you know, it, it was more than just like a mental understanding of it. It was, it was a sort of a deeper understanding. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that for you, like it was for me, it, it connected you to some, some place in you that felt distinctly downwards, like earthy. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Cool. It yeah. seems to be a common experience for most men. Yeah. Okay. So let's. You know, for the guys who have no idea what we're talking about, um, let's, I guess, de define what archetypes are and what we're really talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, mm -hmm. So Carl Jung is the guy, the go-to guy when we're going to talk about the definition of what an archetype is. Carl Jung was this Swiss pioneer of depth psychology. He used to be the student of Freud, but then he broke uh, he broke away because he didn't agree with Freud's obsession with sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, he thought that there was a lot more at play in the human psyche than just the repressed sexuality. And uh, on his explorations, he went way deep into his dream life and... He also was uh, an avid traveler. And as he was traveling and as he was exploring his own psyche and the, and the cultures of the world, he started finding patterns, like repeating patterns that seemed to be consistent across all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, that struck him as, as very peculiar and very noteworthy. And it, it was in noticing these similarities that his theory of the archetype started forming. So he would see how, for instance, myths in cultures would appear to his clients in the form of dreams. Mm -hmm. And that the very stories that they would be telling in cultures, like a, particularly the, the older cultures, the ones that had um, kept their stories alive, they would be almost mirror images of like the personal dream life. And um, so he, he posed a theory that as humanity evolves, we sort of leave these imprints in what he calls the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. So every person that lives doesn't only have a relationship to his day-to-day -day waking reality he's all also or she is also connected somehow to some deep shared uh, like a human hard drive almost mm -hmm. like a psychological human hard drive that actually um, exerts a tremendous amount of influence on us whether we like it or not mm -hmm. and this hard drive is in, has certain programs installed on it this is the metaphor I like to use, yeah, and yeah. and and they will run uh, in our in our lives in ways that we can be conscious of, or more likely for the for the average person, they will be un unconscious of them. Yeah. Um, so this work of um, awakening to the existence of archetypes 
and understanding that these archetypes, they have certain characteristics that are actually observable in our lives. So, for instance, when the warrior archetype comes online inside of us, it has pre a predictable way of playing out. Mm -hmm. And once we start understanding how that works, we can start navigating our lives in a, in a whole new way. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you brought up the warrior archetype. Can you, you know, give a little bit of a description about what that is and I guess how it exists in maybe myth and, you know, maybe movies and also within men around the world? Yeah, for sure. I think the warrior archetype in particular, uh, among those poor archetypes that we're talking about, mm -hmm. is is very important in terms of the journey from boyhood to manhood. Um, Joseph Campbell uh, was the mythologist that explained the idea of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So the hero's journey is the boy version of the warrior archetype. In this particular system of archetypes that we're working with, it's the, the boy version. And... So, so the, the hero is characterized by um, a, a leaving our familiar surroundings, being faced with all kinds of challenges, conquering them, prevailing, and returning back home with uh, the gifts of the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really, what that is essentially about in the lives of men is to become. Uh, autonomous selves that have freed freed ourselves from the you know the the incredible influence of mother energy mm -hmm. you follow me so far yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like this idea that as boys uh, our mother is in a way like this all omnipotent creature in our lives and we haven't fully stepped into the, the world of men. So we step into the world of men by way of the hero, which is essentially a, a warrior dynamic, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, you can almost like picture the um, umbilical cord being cut by a sword, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Metaphorically. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I like that one too. Uh, <laughs> so we we move into the the geography of manhood, and then what is the warrior archetype? What does it mean? Uh, how does it show up? So the warrior archetype really is an archetype of action. Uh, it's what gets us to fucking do shit. You know, to just we wake up. In the morning, maybe we don't feel like feel like it. You know, we don't feel like getting out of bed. We don't feel like getting to work, but we still know that we have to. Mm -hmm. That's that's the warrior archetype that helps us uh, connect to a purpose that's more important than how I feel in this present moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's. Imagine a warrior in, in any kind of movie. He's always in a position of taking orders from a king or from a superior. Yeah. And that's um, characteristic of the warrior. As, as warriors, we need to somehow be in connection with a transpersonal purpose. Essentially, a mission that's bigger than ourselves. Mm-hmm. And unless we do that, if we, if we, if the most important thing in our lives is our own happiness, then the warrior will move into what we call the shadow. Mm -hmm. um, so the warrior, as all of the other three archetypes, has an active and a passive shadow. And um, the active shadow of the warrior is the sadist where I will actually actively take pleasure in harming others and making their lives miserable. Yeah, which we we can kind of see in the world today, you know, how it manifests in war and maybe crime and all of that, right? Yeah, I think in the world right now, there are loads of examples of this, but the one that is most alive for me right now is 
is IS. Mm -hmm. You know, the group of those radical, uh, crazy, um, so-called Muslim terrorists. Yeah. For me, uh, you know, as as I see them, the whole religion thing is just uh, an alibi for being complete jerks in the world. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would agree. Uh, Yeah. And... And that's what the sadist looks like. I mean, you have seen these pictures of they're lining up their prisoners in like um, orange garb, you know, and with these these uh, masks on them. They basically they just slit their throats, mm-hmm. and then they send the videos into the world as like a, a warning or whatever. Mm-hmm. But this is. Like, it may look powerful, but it's incredibly dysfunctional and actually weak behavior. Yeah, so can we talk about how, you know, you mentioned how there are, you know, the the boy archetypes, the immature archetypes, and then you also mentioned the shadow. Can you talk a little bit about how, I guess, how the system is with the immature and the shadow and then the mature archetypes? Uh, so do you want me to speak about the boy archetypes first? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so the boy archetypes, as, as I understand them, they, they are, um, more linear, like more of a chronological development, Mm -hmm. more of a predictable pattern of development. I think in terms of growing up there is a biological impulse that puts us on an involuntary evolutionary path Mm -hmm. so we don't choose to grow up biologically but we do yeah yeah so we grow up and then around the year 20 we're done basically Mm -hmm. um but there there are all kinds of things that happen psychologically but also biologically that seems to uh, be somewhat predictable. So we start out as we are born, accessing the archetype of the divine child, um, which is basically, you know, when you look into the baby, at the eyes of a baby, you just you can just see the, you know, the vast mystery of the infinite cosmos, you know, just radiating from their eyes. Yeah, the wonder, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's like he, I can just disappear into the eyes of a baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Just this vast mystery. Mm-hmm. And then it moves uh, moves into the, the precocious child. So remember that this is how Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette have described it. And yeah. for the most part, I agree with what they say. And I, I think they also would agree uh, that there is some uh, back and forth you know it's not like you you're done with one of the archetypes and move on but that you will sort of go back and revisit uh, archetypes uh, at a different point in our lives but so so from moving from the divine child a boy uh, would move into the precocious child which is where the boy would start asking all kinds of questions about the world yeah and uh, maybe even saying outrageously wise things. Like the kind of thing that a sage would say would come out of the mouth of a four-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. So they're accessing some sort of deep, mysterious wisdom, it seems like. yeah. But uh, at, at the same time, they're trying to become individuals in the world by asking questions about, you know, uh, about about the world about daddy how uh, how is it that i came to be and then you know you have to have the story about the the flower and the bee and all of that stuff (laughs) yeah so and then that moves into the uh, oedipal child which is um you all i think most most of your listeners probably have some familiarity with the story of uh, uh, king oedipus yeah who uh killed his father and married his mother um, which is generally not a good thing to do. <laughs> it's not encouraged. <laughs> it's not encouraged. Uh, 
But this is really about uh, a full, um, full connection with the uh, the world of mother, and also with sensitivity, and you know, it's a very much a, a, an embodied feeling part of the boys, the boys' development, and and then eventually that becomes stale. And a lot of, to, to be quite frank, a lot of men haven't really moved on from this yeah well that's why i wanted you to first talk about the boy archetypes because i i believe that a lot of men you know in the society that we have now a lot of men are stuck in some of the immature archetypes for sure and if if you look at this one in particular imagine the the man who comes home and uh, to his family and who changes personality completely the the minute he sees his mother mm -hmm. or that will not do anything that his mother disapproves of because it's very important to him that his mother loves him and that they have a sweet connection mm -hmm. as long as that is true uh, a man can't really reach maturity um so so that's what happens to a lot of a lot of men. Uh, I think this I think this archetype in particular is where a lot of uh, of men get stuck in today's world. Yeah, at least in the more postmodern, uh, more feminized, sensitive culture, like where I live in Norway, this is very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know I've i think there's some theories about that but you know a lot of ancient cultures and you know the native americans there were all these rites of passage for men to sort of transit transition them into manhood and maybe put them through this hero's journey in some way that you were talking about whereas yeah. nowadays especially in the western world there is no real you know ritual or any sort of transition i mean you could kind of say going to college is that but it's it's really not in my mind <laughs> no I, I as far as i'm concerned we don't really have good rites of passage in our western culture anymore mm -hmm. i mean um there may be uh folks you know sort of pretend rites of passage in in the army and that kind of thing and maybe sometimes it even works mm -hmm. and it's uh, more specialized forces and that kind of thing i think they have probably a more powerful way of of making that happen but for the most part uh i don't think we do them um but you mentioned native americans and uh, you know indigenous cultures in general they are incredibly focused on this mm -hmm. they they realize that unless you address this you would have a huge cultural problem in the tribe where the men would uh essentially uh, become troublemakers or not competent in filling the the roles that they needed to step into mm -hmm. and um, and that's why these cultures had by our our contemporary standards very extreme ways of dealing with it so for instance the aborigines um, once they went on their rite of passage their um, they went into, uh, I don't even remember what they called it right now, but they go on a walkabout, yeah? Mm -hmm. And once they return, they're not allowed to speak to their mother for the rest of their lives. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. And similar things happen in Native American tribes where they, they uh, as, as far as I can, I can remember, they would communicate with their mothers via their sisters and that kind of thing, yeah? Mm-hmm. Because in these tribal cultures, they knew the power of the mom, the mother energy to sort of suffocate and stifle the unfolding of the masculine energy in the boy. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, the, the, the elders would sort of rob the boy from the, the world of the women. Um, and, and this happened in different ways in different cultures. But it, it would... It would need to be quite traumatic, in, according to, to to this old way of thinking, because there was there was a way in which they had to snap out 
of a world that was characterized by sensitivity and feeling and consensus and those things. Mm -hmm. So there were some pretty horrific rites of passage around the world that I'm quite glad that we're not having to go through these days. Yeah, I think it's a good thing that, yeah, like you said, we've outgrown them. But I think we haven't gotten to the point where we've um, found something better yet. Maybe we're in some sort of transitional period. Yeah, I think... I'm not sure it's a conscious transitional period. But, yeah. <laughs> but definitely there's, uh, there, is, um, there is a need for a different way of doing it, I think. I mean, the whole purpose of these rites of passage is that the boy needs to become so humbled that he basically surrenders his life to something larger than himself. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose of rites of passage. So in the old culture, it would be so extreme that they basically, they, they couldn't take it anymore sometimes. And then in a way, their whole ego structure would collapse mm -hmm. and be alchemized into something that lived in service of something sacred. Uh, and today, um, I think there is a movement in, in some small pockets of the world to re-embrace ritual process like that. Mm -hmm. um, and... And when you look at the world and all the violence and unconsciousness that's playing out, it can almost inevitably be always be um, betrayed back to a lack of ritual process. Yeah, and that that manifests itself as the shadow archetypes or the immature archetypes or both. Yeah, both. I would say for sure. Uh, the interplay between the boy archetypes and the man archetypes can be subtle at times. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think what is most relevant in terms of making this practical and easy to understand is to just, to just get that there are such things as boy archetypes and that they are influencing us. Mm -hmm. for, for the most part, to have... Um, to have a focus on the, the the man archetypes is is what I find to be. You know, if we have so much bandwidth and so much time to understand a very complex material, then then let's focus on the fact that we have four archetypes: king, warrior, magician, lover, mm -hmm. and they have shadows. Mm -hmm. It's a very good starting point. And um, and in terms of the, the warrior, you can see it run rampant in the world. And, um, you know, we, we spoke about the sadist, which is, is more of an active, more of a, like an outwards, more of an explosive motion. But a lot of these, these men who are stuck in the world of mother energy, mm -hmm. they will be more on the passive side of things. Yeah. So for the man listening right now who has trouble standing up to your mother or you you find that you know the world of the feminine is um, scary to you, or it's it's hard to navigate. Maybe you're afraid of being rejected or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, you will go into more of the passive, and that is the masochist. So the masochist masochist takes warrior energy and channels it inwards, mm -hmm. which would be a motion of. Oh, I suck. I can't never do anything right. I'm pathetic weakling. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's keep talking about the the other mature archetypes. Yeah, which one do you want to start with? Well, is there anything else? Do you want to talk about more about the warrior? Uh, I feel pretty complete with it, Michael. Unless you have some questions, I'd be happy to move on to one of the other ones. No, yeah, let's move on to. Well, we let's. I think we should save King for last. <laughs> cool, man. Um, let's let's let, let's get into the magician. Great. So, um, I think in terms of the magician, everyone has 
a strong relationship to the character of Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. So let's just start there. Yeah, sure. And uh, and picturing this wise ancient man with a beard, you know, and he has this top hat and and one of the things that, that you will see Gandalf do at the very start of this saga that Tolkien wrote for us mm -hmm. is that he travels to the libraries in Gondor to to, to study to study a about the ring because he suspects that Sauron is on the move again and he wants to know for sure. Mm -hmm. So in in observing that you see one of the first qualities of the magician. It's it's an ability to go on the search for knowledge mm -hmm. both of the scientific realm and the esoteric realm. Mm -hmm. So the magicians of the world and the magician in you listening will be those men that have access to sort of expert knowledge, a kind of rarefied knowledge that isn't easily accessible just from common sources of like mainstream knowledge. It's, it's more... Like the magician uh, archetype is what helps us discover new fields of science, that helps us discover um, the human genome, you know, that mm -hmm. the, the nuclear bomb, uh, whatever it is. So in, in mentioning the nuclear bomb, you can tell immediately that, okay, so the magician can help us work for the benefit of humanity or for the detriment of humanity. Yeah, and it's very powerful. Very powerful. So the magician archetype is very powerful in the world today in terms of its shadow running rampant, rampant in the world of consumerism. Mm -hmm. So look at the world of marketing, Michael. Uh, what happens there? What what is it that a marketer will often do in order to get us to buy the product? Well, they're they're convincing us. I mean, I don't <laughs> I don't know exactly how they do it, but I know there's a lot of um a lot of influence on the deeper subconscious level, right? Right. Yeah, I think I think marketing is a lot about psychology. Yeah. Like mostly about psychology, 90% psychology. And, and when you see the world of marketing, for the most part, it's lies. Yeah. <laughs> they lie. Um, they tell us we need this product and we don't. Mm hmm and they tell us that it will do great things for our hair or our skin or our whatever, our the length of our dick, you know, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and they lie. It's not true. Mm -hmm. But they know exactly where to to press, you know, what sore points to press. Mm -hmm. They know the man who feels that his dick is a little bit too small would love to have it uh, bigger you know we all receive emails like this in our inbox yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so the magician the shadow magician in marketing is just one example obviously but mm -hmm. it will target it will use psychological insight into human nature and it will go in there and stirring up some shit mm -hmm. so that the the uh, the the target will want to buy the product that they don't need. Yeah. That said, there are also products that are good. Mm -hmm. You know, and a true mature magician would only market products that are actually beneficial to human beings. Mm-hmm. It's only the shadow magician that would try and push crap onto, onto um, naive people. Yeah. 
So this is the active shadow of the magician. We call it the manipulator. The manipulator can also be used in terms of uh, playing dirty games on the stock exchange. Yeah. Uh, to uh, basically uh, abuse the planet in order to reap the benefit of natural resources. Mm-hmm. The one one thing that comes to my mind is uh, in relationships, you know, maybe playing head games and manipulating your partner. For sure. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yeah, and I think right now it, it, it's um, worth pausing uh, as, as you as a listener. Where is it in your life that you are essentially out of integrity, telling lies, in order to get results that are beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. We generally lie or play these games only because it's beneficial for us. Seemingly beneficial for us. Yeah. It never is, obviously, but it's worth looking at that. I can see this play out in my my own life ever more subtly but still quite a bit mm -hmm. but you're aware of it I, th I th I'm sure there are places in my life where I'm not aware of it to be honest mm -hmm. yeah that's true I think that's a journey that we're all on of making it more and more conscious mm -hmm. yeah and that's that's one of the ways that these archetypes can be so powerful right is giving us the tools and the system to be able to understand, you know, our, our shadow forms, our shadow archetypes and how they're playing out. Yeah. Basically it allows us, it give us, gives us a way to become more aware of ourselves. That's exactly what it does. Mm -hmm. When you, when you say that, Michael, I, I start thinking about the passive pole of the magician shadow, which is the innocent one. Mm-hmm. And I'm just struck by this this idea that if it's a frequent experience in my life that people confront me, they challenge me on my opinions or my actions or whatever, mm -hmm. and I I throw it back at them immediately saying, you know, what are you talking about? Or I can't see this or maybe even shaming them for suggesting that. Mm hmm. When I do that, I've already spotted my manipulator. Yeah. <laughs> because they are working in tandem. That's the unique characteristic about the archetypes. We call them bipolar. So what that means is that when our ego structure isn't uh, mature yet... You know, the extent to which our ego structure hasn't fully developed is the extent to which we will be taken by the archetypal shadow. Mm -hmm. And we will pen, uh, percolate back and forth. So I remember when I was little, um, I, I would get challenged. Uh, um, no. I would I would be quite shy and um, seemingly weak I think on the outside some of the time. Yeah. But then if I was challenged really strongly, eventually I would just snap and people would get really scared of me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's an example of how one archetypal shadow can turn to another just like that. Mhm. Mm Going from the more passive to the active, you're saying. Yeah, so that's that's a more of a, uh, an obvious example, but it's also it also happens very subtly in our lives. I think. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize any of this in your life? Yeah. Um, right now, I'm I'm struggling with uh, the the warrior archetype and really taking action. Um, I right. think the for the the last few years the magician archetype has been very strong in my life. You know, I've been doing a lot of 
research externally, a lot of studying, a lot of reading, all of that, a lot of learning, and also a lot of looking inward and, you know, a lot of self-discovery and all of that. Yeah. And so I'm at the point where, you know, I've, I've been consciously uh, less active overall and less active as the warrior, right? Um, uh-huh. To, so that I can focus on the magician side of things. Um, yeah. And now I'm at the point where I'm, I guess, transitioning to be, be more active and embrace the warrior archetype. So that's sort of where I'm at right now. And this whole project that I'm working on is, you know, a, a big part of that. This is this is sort of my step into the warrior archetype. What I hear and what you just said is that you've been on a journey of self-discovery for many years and and you've come to the point in your life where you realize that in order to keep moving forward you need to start manifesting some results of that exploration. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's incredibly important, that transition that you're in right now. And I think it's very relevant for the men listening as well, mm-hmm. is that it's easy to get stuck in the world of ideas. Yeah, definitely. Ideas are delicious. You know, we can we can spend whole evenings exploring them together and it would feel like time well spent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like good ideas can make you feel good about yourself without necessarily making any real actual change in in the world right yeah that's a bitch of it isn't it Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's a it's a commonly um commonly used trap (laughs) a lot of a lot of men fall into it yeah and we in all of the talks we've been making it a point to to stress the the importance of taking action and taking practical steps um yeah but at the same time you know, like the conversation we're having right now is definitely more of an ideas conversation. Um, and I do think there is a lot of power in that. So I, I don't want people to to be, you know, dissuaded from um, being being able to understand a concept like the archetypes. There, There is a lot of power in that, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's an enormous amount of power in this, and I I like, I like a quote. Um, philosopher Kel- Ken Wilber he likes to say that the map is not the territory. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of a lot of guys get so fascinated by the map mm-hmm. that they don't bother to step into the territory. Mm-hmm. And it in that place you breed arrogance. Mm -hmm. You come so fucking arrogant and think you know everything about the world, but you haven't even started exploring it. Yeah, there's no experience. No experience. It's just book learning, yeah? Mm -hmm. Taking some trainings online or some weekend workshops, but not really having anything to show for it. Mm -hmm. So that's where the warrior... uh, comes in you know you really need to start manifesting at one point Mm -hmm. yeah and i agree this is an ideas conversation but it is important for me to to keep uh reflecting on what impact this has in our practical lives as well yeah so do you think we should continue do we do we really need to get into the lover and the king how can we I think so. Okay, I so... think it makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah. So let's let's finish that up and we'll we'll at the end we'll tie it up with some some practical action steps. Yeah. I just want to say one more thing about the magician. I could I could speak about the magician for 2 hours if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. One more thing before we move on. Mm-hmm. On is that in my in my experience working with men, there's like there's a uh a split in the magician archetype where we can operate from the magician in the left brain mode or the right brain mode. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, when I, when I use a word like energy, for instance, they would immediately start thinking about the world of physics. Yeah. You know, whether it's electricity or, you know, kinetic energy or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that would be more of like left brain mode. But yeah. there is actually like a, 
spiritual energy as well mm -hmm. that lives in the body and that lives in the world that we can actually develop an, a, a relationship to. It's not new age woo-woo. I believe this is real. And this is also part of the magician to, to embody the more right brain hemisphere. And a lot of men struggle with that side of things. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, a good example of that is is art and musicians, right? I think that's something that men can relate to. Yeah. Yeah, let's use that as a segue to the lover. Okay. Uh, art, you know, art is one of the big expressions of the lover energy. Uh, really, the purpose of the lover in our lives is to... Um, to connect us with the human experience, to mm -hmm. connect us with being alive, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other archetypes, they have very scary shadows in that they, uh, they disconnect us from the inherent value of life. But the lover, only when we have the lover present in our lives, do we see in life itself inherent value? See what I'm saying? It's, it's not only about my purpose in life or this project or whatever. It's yeah. the ability to, to just chill the fuck out every once in a while. To actually live, right? Yeah, man. To actually live. To enjoy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of the listeners can um, feel at home in, in a way of living life that is about completing one project after another. And then at the end of completing the project, they get to enjoy it for about two hours. And then the brain starts working on the next one. Yeah. You know, so the lover is about really... Dropping in with your woman, maybe. Listening to music. Enjoying slowly the exquisite taste of a fine wine. Mm -hmm. Having chocolate melt in your tongue instead of gobbling it up like a hungry motherfucker, you know? But just letting it melt. Yes, yeah, stop, stop and smell the flowers, right? Stop and smell the fucking flowers, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> This is this is challenging territory for a lot of men because we we can't or a lot of men can't move very far into this energy before they start worrying that they're becoming feminine or gay. Yeah, or weak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is where a lot of men um, basically kill themselves. Yeah. You know, because they can't ever enjoy their lives in the lover quadrant, they keep churning on all engines in the warrior quadrant. Mm -hmm. So you get burnout, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so the lover archetype is connected to the, the, the Oedipal child that I was talking about previous previously which was connected to the realm of mother in a very strong way. Mm -hmm. The lover archetype isn't so much connected to the, the world of mother, but it certainly is the gateway to connecting with the feminine in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have that classic um, communication... Uh, chasm between men and women where where men want to uh, solve their problem and, and women just want to speak about it you know yeah <laughs> there's this funny there's this funny uh, video on youtube uh, where uh, a guy sits with his girlfriend and she has uh, a nail hammered into her skull have you seen that one he keeps he keeps saying you have a nail in your head <laughs> and <laughs> And she complains, oh, you, you just don't listen. I have a headache and it's just painful. Can't you just listen and empathize with me for one second? 
No, just get the nail out of your head and your problem will be solved. <laughs> you know, it's classic, right? Yeah. <laughs> and really, when a man isn't accessing his lover, he can't just drop in with his woman and feel with her. Mm -hmm. So you get the shadow expressions of the lover, which is on the one hand, the active side is the addic addicted one. Mm -hmm. Like basically pursuing addictions nonstop. Yeah. And the passive is the impotent one. Mm -hmm. So because I'm essentially afraid of being impotent, I will run towards addictions. Yeah. So a man, for instance, that keeps having to validate his manhood from having new sexual partners constantly. Mm hmm. He's actually running away from his own impotence. It's interesting. And that's that's a that's a common one, at least in the Western world, I would say. I think so. That's not to say that there's anything wrong in having a lot of sexual partners, but we need as as men, we need to be aware of where we're coming from. Mm-hmm. Am I now trying to get it on with this woman because I feel a lot of pain emotionally that I don't want to explore fully? Very important question. Mm hmm Notice a good quiet. Yeah. I'm doing some thinking and I'm uh, hopefully the listeners are having some time to think. Yeah, I enjoyed the quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a perfect expression of the lover right there. I've just. I imagine the listener in that space of neither you nor me speaking. Mm -hmm. actually connected more with his emotions or her emotions. Yeah, I would hope so, if they, they're they not too distracted. Yeah. So how about we just, you know, try and slow down just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And in slowing down, basically opening the doors to the lover archetype. Feel you could you could feel right now listening. If this slow, more silent place makes you fidgety. Yeah, it might make some people uncomfortable. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to a Im very important observation for me. Mm -hmm. Having, I have done some tantra work and done a lot of work in order to master, you know, my orgasm and my ejaculation. So... Mm -hmm. Essentially, I don't want to ejaculate when I have sex with a woman. Yeah. And I don't. Uh, what does a man need to do in order to get to the point of not ejaculating when he has sex? He has to become more at ease with holding a lot of feeling intensity in his nervous system. Mm-hmm. Essentially, pleasure will conquer most men. It will make them ejaculate. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the same dynamic in the man that would have him fidget in the face of silence. Mm -hmm. There is too much intensity in the feeling sphere of what is happening in his moment to moment experience and he wants to run away 
ejaculation generally is running away from pleasure, not the other way around, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the teaching of Tantra. So this is something that I want to transmit to the listener right now. If you have a challenge with premature ejaculation, it's a challenge that resides in the lover archetype. And if you want to start addressing that in a safe way, then start exploring your relationship with being silent with another human being. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful way. Or even with yourself. For sure. That's an even even safer. Even safer. I think that's the best place to start for sure. Mm -hmm. And then when you bring that other person in, especially if it's a woman, all of a sudden the intensity in the nervous system starts wrapping up. Yeah. Do they like me? Is this weird? Am I being attractive? Am I being cool? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at IS, we mentioned them earlier when we talked about the warrior archetype. Yeah. You can see a group of men with an absolute, complete absence of lover energy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's clinically stripped of lover energy, that group. And what does... What happens when you strip your life from lover energy I, I find this very interesting mm -hmm. you start projecting into the afterlife that once I die I will come to a paradise full of virgins and milk and honey mm -hmm. so you have so disowned your ability to have take pleasure in your life that you need to die in order to enjoy yourself That's really crazy. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It is crazy. But it's what's happening in most fundamentalist religious circles in the world. Yeah. Christians, you know, the more conservative right-wing Christians in the United States are in the exact same dynamic. Mm-hmm. They want the rapture. They want the end of the world as soon as possible because then they can have the pleasure of feeling their lover archetype again. Mm -hmm. So they actually have unconscious patterns playing out in the world and, and Jungian circles talk about the archetype of the apocalypse. And the archetype of the apocalypse is given a lot of energy and life in the world today Precisely because these people have disowned their lover archetype completely. Mm -hmm. It's fucking crazy, man. It is, and I hope our our audience can understand and see how powerful these archetypes and understanding and understanding them can be. I hope so. Yeah, I get excited when we talk about this. It feels relevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it feels more and more relevant the more we speak, Michael. I like the way this is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is this is good. It it flowed pretty naturally. Um, yeah. So shall we get into the the king at this point? I think so. We're ready for the royal the the throne. I think. Oh yeah, let's let's yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I do this training online training called Reclaim Your Inner Throne. Mm -hmm. And probably by the time the listener listens to this, uh, it's started. the 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 next round has started. Um, I don't know for sure, but. This idea of the inner throne has become very important to me. Mm -hmm. And obviously that is an expression of our king our, or our inner sovereign. In the case of a woman, I, I will speak about the queen, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so what is this king archetype? Um, you know, we have looked at Lord of the Rings already and since that is such the perfect universe for exploring these archetypes, yeah, 
I want to go back to the third book of the third movie, mm -hmm. which you all know is called Return of the King. Mm -hmm. So this whole arc, this whole epic saga that's that plays out in Middle Earth, um, moves to the return of the king. And and why is that? You know, why is this significant? And why is it not only a um, a smart literary move on the on the uh, on the side of Tolkien, but why is this actually relevant in our lives? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so look then at Middle Earth as a metaphor for your life as a man in the world. Yeah. There are forces of chaos in your life, and they're threatening your borders. This is not a metaphor. You know, take the time to really feel this. Yeah. There is a lot of crap in your life that actually doesn't want to do you good. Let's not be new age naive about this and try and twist everything into being love and light. There is a lot of shit in the world. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. And and this whole story that Tolkien makes is a move from chaos to harmony. And harmony is only restored when the king comes back on, on the throne. It, ha it actually happens at several points in, in Tolkien. Because you have King Theoden of the Rohirrim. Yeah. You know, who has been put under the spell of Saruman by way of Grima Wormtongue. Mm -hmm. And you see this whole scene where Gandalf the White just extracts the, the presence of Saruman from King Theoden. And you can see how life returns to him. Mm -hmm. And as long as King Theoden was cursed, essentially... The Rohirrim, the, that people, was cursed. They couldn't do anything. Because the king, in a way, is the center of the cosmos. It's like all of the, the, tribe, the tribal cultures of the world tend to uh, divide the cosmos into four. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a mandala from Tibet or it's the, the sacred hoops of Native American spirituality, the, the universe is divided into four, which isn't a coincidence in terms of these archetypes because we're talking about four archetypes as well. Mm -hmm. But at the center of this mandala is the sacred mountain, be it Mount Meru in Tibet or, you know, some sort of castle or a throne or whatever it might be, maybe the, 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 the pyramid of Egypt. Um, so the king archetype is at the center of the cosmos, harmonizing the whole cosmos, making sure that the world is essentially functioning. So the king archetype is not only its own archetype, but I, I'm actually sat here with a pyramid next to me. I, I picked it up from my altar before we started speaking. Mm -hmm. And obviously a pyramid is a triangular three-dimensional structure with four faces. So it's, it's wide at the bottom, which you can take as a symbol for grounding and for touching you know, the manifest dimension of our lives, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes narrow and more and more narrow until it reaches the apex where it's just a pinpoint. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptians realized, as all of the cultures of the world have realized when they have been tapping into the king archetype, that at this point in the cosmos, in this sort of the central point of the cosmos, sacred energy pours down from a different realm into the human realm. Is that yeah, yeah. The king... I, I, sorry, I lost you for a second there. You, you, yeah. You cut out um, when you were talking about this energy coming down from the sacred into the human realm. 
Yeah, I talked about Mersha Eliade, the Romanian uh, uh, historian of religion. Mm -hmm. And he says, he talks about this as the axis mundi. So if you draw like a vertical line through the the center of a pyramid, Mm -hmm. that's the axis mundi, yeah? Okay. So the king archetype is the channel that unites the human realm with the divine. Mm Mm-hmm. So, some of your listeners may be uncomfortable with the concept of the divine. Yeah. Some of them may be hardcore atheists. So, let's translate this to their language, yeah? Yeah. Um, what this means is, and I'm going to do that by, by returning to, uh, to Tolkien, mm-hmm. is, you know, when... When Aragorn takes the throne at the end, it becomes a symbol for the new era of Middle-earth. The forces of chaos have been defeated. So, when this atheist or spiritual man wants to translate this into his own life, what does that actually mean? It means that if in my own day-to-day experience, I feel completely fragmented and completely unsure of myself and my direction in the world. Then I have a deficiency in king energy. So the king really is about vision. It is about blessing. You know, Being a king means that I can look you in the eye and affirm your inherent goodness as a human being. Mm -hmm. And most men growing up have never experienced that fully from another man. That makes it all that more important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Robert Bly, he speaks about a world short on father energy. And in this context, the father energy is the same as the king energy. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about it almost as if it were a mineral, like something that you could add to your diet, like salt. Yeah. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. that you you could actually find father energy. But for the most part, it's absent in the world today. Mm -hmm. Because we're short on ritual process. So most men are actually boys. Mm -hmm. Which means that they don't have father energy to impart to other men. They don't have king energy to impart to other men. And then we are faced with a world where older people don't have wisdom to impart to us, so we don't respect elders anymore. Yeah. So we become a culture worshipping teenagers and youth. And all of us try to be young and not old. Mm -hmm. Because we have lost so touch with what is sacred and important about becoming mature that we have completely discredited human maturity altogether. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, it's fucking scary. Yeah. I think that is relevant even to the man who considers himself to be an atheist. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, if have you really ever had another man look at you deeply into the eye and felt a transmission into deeply into you that told you that you are deeply okay? Only a small minority of men alive today have had that. And you think this goes back to the lack of rites of passage and ritual? Yes. 
I think it actually arises from to be quite frank, I think Christianity has a big part uh, in this mm -hmm. because especially the um, the Protestant church, the Lutheran you know lineage of Luther because they they tried to make church more accessible to the common man, but in the process they stripped out everything that you know smacked of ritual. Mm -hmm. Any any ritual process was just extracted, and 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 we were faced with a church that was all of a sudden devoid of. Um, um, ritual process that could serve as transition points in our lives. Mm -hmm. So the church became more accessible, but also more meaningless. Yeah. Uh, similarly, I think that the industrial revolution was incredibly destructive in terms of rite of passage. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I could explore that if you if you want. Yeah, let's let's touch upon it so we can again make it more relevant for everybody listening. Yeah, I'm just mindful of time. Yeah. Um. So most of us, probably myself included, grew up with fathers that were absent most of the time, and they, in turn grew up with fathers that were absent most of the time. Mm -hmm. So somehow over the course of the last several centuries, fathers became absent. And in, in the face of a life experience without fathers around, without generally older men around, um, we we as men became um, hollow in a way. Yeah. We didn't anymore get that nutrition from the masculine river that's supposed to flow through all of us. And in a way, we become without a masculine identity. Mm -hmm. So now as men, we don't know who we are. And a lot of men don't even know if they want to be men. They want to be boys forever. Yeah, you see a I lot of that. Be... What was that? You see a lot of that. Yeah, like men saying straight out that they don't want to grow up mm -hmm. because it's so boring to grow up. Like, what the fuck, dude? Do you, do you want to live in constant irresponsibility for the rest of your life because that's fun? We can only reclaim our inner throne when we become humbled in the same way as boys were humbled in the old tribal cultures, we become so humbled that we realize essentially that our lives isn't about us. It's about something larger that wants to be lived through us. And that is the sort of shocking paradigmatic shift that happens when we when we want to fully embody our masculine maturity mm -hmm. and our kingship mm -hmm. and it's a strange paradox to me that only in finding that we're not the center of the universe do we become the center of the universe yeah <laughs> It is a paradox, but it, I mean, it, it's true. Yeah. And most of the tyrants of the world have, are trying to be the center of the universe without having earned it through their own evolutionary process by mm -hmm. becoming mature human beings. Mm -hmm. So they over identify with the archetype of the king from an immature place, which leads them to becoming tyrants. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and a tyrant inevitably hasn't had a blessing from his father. You can be sure of that. Yeah. So we have a lot of immature men these days, Ivan, is, is what we've, we've said here. So what do we do about it? What is, what's the next step? There are many ways of addressing this. I, I'm trying in my own small way to address this uh, situation with my Reclaim Your Inner Throne training. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, from the testimonials from previous participants, that process actually works. So uh, men having been on that in the past saying, this is the training that turned me into a man. Uh, which is great for me to see that the power of this material. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way to to check that out. Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll include links to, to all your information and all of that. Great. There are other rites of passage that are available in the world today. Um, Mankind Project provides, uh, provides one of them. Mm-hmm. Is a powerful one. Um, I think it will. If you're a man who's wanting, um, if if what I've spoken about resonates for you, and you're kind of sat there now with a, oh fuck, I'm <laughs> not a mature man. I'm mm -hmm. a boy. I don't want to be a boy. If you're sat with that kind of feeling right now, then. Mankind Project's new warrior training adventure is probably going to help you a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based in large part on the same source material as my Reclaim Your Inner Throne training. Okay. What, what is that source material? It's exactly what we're talking about, the archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, if if this is something that you're wanting then just look up initiations on Google. Uh, there is men's culture is very important. And, and men's culture that isn't too um, soft. I mean, it is important that in this process, we embrace our sensitivity and our more feminine uh, parts of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Because unless we do that, we will forever try to not be feminine. Yeah. And we will essentially become weaker for it. But there are a lot of men out there in the world of self-development that have become really soft. Yeah. <laughs> and that don't want to call you on your shit because it's too confronting for them. Mm -hmm. So it's... I really recommend that you start building men's culture in your life that has a fiercer edge to it. Essentially, men in your life that you trust to tell you that you're full of shit when you actually are. Mm -hmm. I think that will be maybe the most important thing you can do. Yeah, surround yourself with with authentic men essentially authentic masculine men who are not afraid of their femininity mm -hmm. yeah which might be hard to do these days based on what we talked about right <laughs> yeah i think there are places in the world where you will be the first man who's interested mm -hmm. in setting up that men's culture so this is this is what is so fucking interesting about uh, the state of the world right now is in the moment of realizing you want this, you are actually quite likely stepping into a king position in your local community. Mm -hmm. So in order to create the culture that you need in order to re reclaim your inner throne, you need to already start claiming your inner throne. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a funny kind of alchemy that is really calling us as men to step into a way bigger life of leadership and service. Mm -hmm. 
and it's going to be scary for a lot of you. But if you really care about living your life to the fullest, and if you're sick of dicking around and being a shithead, you know, then this is actually something that you've got to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm not saying that you're a shithead, but, um, <laughs> you know, I get excited when I start going. Some Some men are complete narcissists, you know, and they need this um, this feeling of um, being humbled. Yeah, they need a kick in the face a little bit. Yeah, and you can be the one providing it for them. Mm-hmm. As a listener, you're, you're already way ahead of, of the pack. Yeah. So my blessings to you for even being here in the first place is a great thing. Yeah, and, and w- one of the other conversations that we had with uh, Owen Marcus, he talked about um, emotional intelligence, masculine emotional intel- intelligence, and the importance of men's groups for that, which I think definitely um, parallels with, with what we're talking about here. He, he he talked about the importance of simply just being around other men and hanging out and, you know, doing what men do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. And it's funny how that is almost like learning a new language for a lot of men. Yeah. All right, Ivan. I think we uh, we're coming up at the end of our conversation here. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we close out? No, I, I think only only that I'm I'm really grateful that you're doing this, Michael, and. Uh, that this is something that you care about enough to invest this much energy into it. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the world scene right now, um, there are a lot of problems, but if I was going to identify the biggest one, the one that seems to be at the root of most of the other ones, Mm -hmm. it is what we're talking about. It is... Uh, uh, a broken masculine um, it's like men in the world have lost touch with their nature Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to speak about women having lost touch with their nature which is obviously true as well but uh, we're just in a desperate situation in the world from a lack of mature masculine men Mm -hmm. you know there's so much stuff like all of the breakdown of financial structures and uh, the ecosphere and everything that's happening in Russia and with IS and you know whatever it is that's happening it's generally a problem with masculinity it's it's a flaw in how masculinity is being viewed Mm mm-hmm so what you're doing and uh, what I think all of us as, as you know, your interview objects on this course are doing, I think, is maybe the biggest challenge of our generation. Yeah, and, I agree. Yeah. And uh, I'm also just really glad that you men are listening in right now and care enough about this that you want to invest like an hour, more than an hour of your time listening about some weird thing, archetypes, whatever, you know, but, but actually caring about this enough to, to give a damn and to, and to, to be a force for good in the world. Mm -hmm. And I want to, to send my blessings and, you know, give you every, encouragement on that journey that I can possibly give you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for doing this, Ivan. I think you shared shared some really deep insight into the masculine with this conversation. I'm glad to hear that. It was it's been a lot of fun to talk to you. Yeah, this was a good conversation. Thanks thanks so much for doing this. Um my pleasure. Yeah, I, I normally, uh, on the other interviews, I've been asking the other men um, if there's any mistakes that they've made in their lives 
that they would be willing to share with us. Is there anything you have like that? Maybe a lesson that you've learned? I think the lesson I've learned is I'm way less special than I thought that I was. <laughs> and I think I'm still learning that lesson. Yeah. yeah. Well, that goes back to the paradox you were talking about, right? Of not being the center of the universe. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like the more I realize that, the more people come to me and say, man, you've changed. You seem to be so much more in your center. And wow, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, I feel way less special than I ever felt. Mm -hmm. It's it's a strange thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it can be as simple as just don't be selfish, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. think so. I think that's a very. I I know that I've I've done weird things with that concept as well, and become more of the guy who serves out of duty and obligation, and it becomes such a drag, and I become the martyr that sacrifices myself, mm -hmm. and all that crap, you know. Uh, so there are there are pitfalls in every <laughs> on every path. Yeah. But, Essentially, I agree with what you're saying. Don't be selfish. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank, thanks for sharing that with us. It's a, it's a simple but a powerful message. Yeah, we're all human beings. We're all men trying to be the best man we can be. And we're all going to struggle with imperfections, trying to be something we're not, not realizing what we are when we actually are it. You know, there's... Life is just riddled with difficulty and challenge and it never gets perfect. And I think that's just one of the uh, sad facts of being human. It never gets just right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would be boring if it did. It would quickly get boring. <laughs> well, I'm glad you have that perspective. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ivan, thanks so much for doing this. It's been, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, you too, my friend. Have a good one. That struck him as, as very peculiar and very noteworthy, and it, it was in noticing the similarities that his theory of the archetype started forming. So he would see how, for instance, myths in cultures would appear to his clients in the form of dreams. Mm -hmm. And that the very stories that they would be telling in cultures, like a, particularly the, the older cultures, the ones that had um, kept their stories alive, they would be almost mirror images of like the personal dream life. And um, so he, he posed a theory that as humanity evolves, we sort of leave these imprints in what he calls the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. So every person that lives doesn't only have a relationship to his day-to-day -day waking reality he's all also or she is also connected somehow to some deep shared uh, like a, a human hard drive almost mm -hmm. like a psychological human hard drive that actually um, exerts a tremendous amount of influence on us whether we like it or not mm -hmm. and this hard drive is in, has certain programs installed on it this is the metaphor I like to use, yeah, and yeah. and and they will run uh, in our in our lives in ways that we can be conscious of, or more likely for the for the average person, they will be un unconscious of them. Yeah. Um, so this work of um, awakening to the existence of archetypes. And understanding that these archetypes, they have certain characteristics that are actually observable in our lives. So, 
for instance, when the warrior archetype comes online inside of us, it has pre a predictable way of playing out. Mm -hmm. And once we start understanding how that works, we can start navigating our lives in a, in a whole new way. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you brought up the warrior archetype. Can you, you know, give a little bit of a description about what that is and I guess how it exists in maybe myth and, you know, maybe movies and also within men around the world? Yeah, for sure. I think the warrior archetype in particular, uh, among those four archetypes that we're talking about, mm -hmm. is is very important in terms of the journey from boyhood to manhood. Um, Joseph Campbell uh, was the mythologist that explained the idea of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So the hero's journey is the boy version of the warrior archetype. In this particular system of archetypes that we're working with, it's the, the boy version. And... So, so the, the hero is characterized by um, a, a leaving our familiar surroundings, being faced with all kinds of challenges, conquering them, prevailing, and returning back home with uh, the gifts of the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And really, what that is essentially about in the lives of men is to become... Uh, autonomous selves that have freed freed ourselves from the you know the the incredible influence of mother energy mm -hmm. you follow me so far yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like this idea that as boys uh, our mother is in a way like this all omnipotent creature in our lives and we haven't fully stepped into the, the world of men. So we step into the world of men by way of the hero, which is essentially a, a warrior dynamic, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, you can almost like picture the um, umbilical cord being cut by a sword, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Metaphorically. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I like that one too. Uh, <laughs> so we we move into the the geography of manhood, and then what is the warrior archetype? What does it mean? Uh, how does it show up? So the warrior archetype really is an archetype of action. Uh, it's what gets us to fucking do shit. You know, to just we wake up. In the morning, maybe we don't feel like feel like it. You know, we don't feel like getting out of bed. We don't feel like getting to work, but we still know that we have to. Mm -hmm. That's that's the warrior archetype that helps us uh, connect to a purpose that's more important than how I feel in this present moment. Yeah. You know, I think that. It was sort of an experience of coming full circle because when I was a little boy, like six or seven years old, I I was incredibly into fairy tales and mythology. Mm -hmm. And um, in those early years, you know, I would consume Greek mythology and Norwegian fairy tales and the Brothers Grimm and everything. And there was something about the way the archetype spoke to me that had me reconnect with that part of me, that mythological, um, sort of a deeper, more earthy uh, quality of my psyche. Mm -hmm. I think that's what was going on there. Yeah, I can relate to that. When I when I first read uh, King Warrior, Magician, Lover, it was a similar, um, you know, resonance. It just it sort of made sense to me on a level beyond you know everyday. Um, you know, it, it was more than just like a mental understanding of it. It was, it was a sort of a deeper understanding. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that for you, like it was for me, it, it connected you to some, some place in you that felt distinctly downwards, like earthy. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Cool. It yeah. seems to be a common experience for most men. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's, you know, for the guys who have no idea what we're talking about, um, let's, I guess, de define what archetypes are and what we're really talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, mm -hmm. So Carl Jung is the guy, the go-to guy when we're going to talk about the definition of what an archetype is. Carl Jung was this Swiss pioneer of depth psychology. He used to be the student of Freud, but then he broke uh, he broke away because he didn't agree with Freud's obsession with sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, he thought that there was a lot more at play in the human psyche than just the repressed sexuality. And uh, on his explorations, he went way deep into his dream life and he also was uh, an avid traveler. And as he was traveling and as he was exploring his own psyche and the, and the cultures of the world, he started finding patterns, like repeating patterns that seemed to be consistent across all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Okay, Ivan, let's uh, let's start this off with you telling us a little bit about your story, your journey, um, everything that led you to what you're doing now and what you're doing now. Yeah, with pleasure, Michael. Um, there are all kinds of places where I could start my story, but I'd like to start it at the start of my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a male lineage that had repressed sexuality and power quite strongly. Mm -hmm. I only realized that after many years of soul searching, but it was the beginning uh, of a really agonizing journey of falling apart for me at the start of my twenties. Yeah. Um, I think that particular t uh, age is, is, crucial in the, in the lives of most men and it's like we become more vulnerable mm -hmm. to to um uh, maybe our soul you know there's there's a way our soul starts communicating to us and the way that it communicated to me in this in this part of my life was violent as fuck and i i was really afraid michael Mm -hmm. Because what was starting to happen was that I saw myself killing people, I saw myself raping people, and uh, I was terrified of of being me basically at that uh, point in in my life, and and not knowing any uh, anything about what was going on for me, um, I I was desperate to find a way to deal with the terror of of this this tsunami of uh, terrifying imagery that was co hammering me constantly. Mm -hmm. And I discovered meditation. And uh, I meditated like a motherfucker for many years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Essentially, because I was afraid of myself. You know, what might happen if I lost control of my thoughts was that these these thoughts that had started at the start of my 20s, they, they, they came back. Mm -hmm. And um, it was only, uh, I think, when I was about 28 years old when I realized that I was running away from life with my meditation practice. Yeah. Um, I was in India uh, at that point. Uh, I was in Bodh Gaya. And I remember it distinctly to this day. You know, it's going to be one of those defining stories of my life. There was this uh, Swedish woman that I really liked there, um, mm -hmm. and we had a connection. We we kept meeting at this restaurant at the outskirts of Bodh Gaya. It was this dusty road with rickshaws and everything, and uh, and I liked her, man. I really did. Yeah. But my expertise was in meditation and not in talking to women. Yeah. 
So I had no idea what to do with this woman. And that story sort of ended uh, when my travel party, our group, we were about to leave Bodhgaya and I was like running around the town trying to find her because I really wanted to see her again. And then I did find her, but I could see her back only and she was walking next to a man and she was sort of walking into the night and out of my life and I didn't find it in me to shout her name or to run after her because it looked like she was taken you yeah. know, by this other man. Mm -hmm. And my life completely changed at that point. I realized that my seven or eight years of intense meditation practice had been running away from basically uh, suppressing my desire and my, uh, my desire to be with women and to be more fully in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered men's work and started opening up to the more primal parts of my psyche. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you come across archetypes in, in the way that you know them now? I think that must be uh, six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a podcast, uh, or actually I think it was a, a series of CDs. I believe it was Adam Gillard, I think. I don't remember exactly, but I think he interviewed someone who spoke about the archetypes, and I listened to that interview. Mm -hmm. So that must be six or seven years ago, and immediately I felt like, felt at home. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was it about it that uh, connected with you?